Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Father, we just come before you. Lord, we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here tonight. Lord, we don't take, for, take it for advantage that we get to come into your house to worship you freely and to just to draw close to you. And Lord, we fully expect that, it's, uh, that your Holy Spirit's going to be our teacher. We don't come to hear from a man, to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come to church to fulfill a tradition or to, to get penance for attendance. But Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. So we ask in the name of Jesus that your Holy Holy Spirit would be our teacher, be our counselor, would be our guidance. Lord, I pray that you would remind us and show us things out of the Word of God that we've heard, that we've seen before, Lord. And I pray that you would speak life into our, into our lives tonight, Lord, that we would leave this place equipped to be what you've called us, to be what you've described us, to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, Lord, to shine your glory to a lost and dying world. And Lord, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with. Lord, we ask that you bless all of our brothers and sisters all across the Inland Empire. We don't ever think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather we're co-laborers in the body of Christ, working together to build your kingdom, God, for your glory. So, Lord, we ask that you bless all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world. Lord, we ask that you bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Calvary Chapel brothers and sisters, all the churches that belong to the various denominations that preach Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Lord, we lift up Harvest, and Lord, we lift up uh, Sandals and, and the Way World Outreach. God, we ask that you bless Ecclesia and Emmanuel Baptist and New Creation. Lord, I ask that your hand would be on open. Oak Valley, on Citizens, Lord, on Abundant Living, Lord, all the churches across the Indian Empire, more than we could name tonight, but Lord, I pray that you would bless them as you have blessed us, Lord, because we are truly many members of one body working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So to you be the praise, to you be the glory, to you be the honor, in Jesus' mighty name. We all said, Amen. Amen. Well, tonight is the Sunday night, and because we talked about this, I would made mention of what's going on on Saturday. I wanted to just take a, a segue, and really, I'm doing something a little bit different than I've ever done. I'm going to take an adaptation from what we're actually doing on our Friday night services in our young adults. Every, every February, we go through a series on the topic of love, and I felt like, as we talked on Friday night, I really felt like the message was just so important that I didn't want to just leave it to that group. I really feel like we, the church, need to grab a hold of what God has, and so I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to do what preachers do. I'm not going to re-preach a message. It's an adaptation. I'm taking the concept of what we taught on, on Friday night, and I'm going to, we're going to expound on it. We're going to go a little bit deeper tonight because our message, we have some more time to get into the Word of God than we do on a Friday night. But, you know, it, it's a great opportunity to say, man, I really liked what you talked about tonight. Then uh, we have Friday night's uh, young adult service if you're between the ages of 18 and 30, and uh, you'll get more of it every, every Friday night. But tonight I believe that God's got a great word for us. And I want to talk to you this Sunday before Valentine's Day because I kind of want to just, I feel like sometimes in my own life, I, I, I'm always the awkward pastor, yeah, in, in, in our, in our, especially in our young adults ministry. Whenever I see something, whenever I see a guy and a girl standing next to each other, and, and I know what's going on, but they haven't said anything yet, I'm always like, what's up? What's going on? You know, I remember my, one of my friends, Antonio, his brother, uh, and, his, and his, his brother is now his brother's wife. And they came to shift and they were just friends. And he was like, dude, don't talk to them about dating. They're not dating yet. He's, he's real shy. He's, and so first thing, he come up and I'm like, what's up, dude? When are you going to ask her out? And he was like, my, my friend was like, no, no. Well, they got married. See, I'm the matchmaker. But anyways. <laughs> Sometimes I, I, it's just good to address the elephant in the room. Everybody kind of thinks about it. And, and, you know, Saturday's Valentine's Day. And Valentine's Day brings this whole subject of love kind of to the forefront of our lives. And, and, and I'll just be honest with you. Whether you're single or whether you're married, Valentine's Day can get a little stressful. And the reason is, is I know in my own life, I'll just speak on my own occasion or on my own life that, you know, th there's this expectation. You know, I don't, I, I never know what to do. I never know, do, do, I, do I go too far? Do, do I spend this much money? Do, you know, I know, do I get her just a little bit? Do I, do I, does she want the diamond earrings? And everybody, all the girls are like, yes, she does. But, you know, I mean, you can only do that for so long. And every year you've got to keep upping it. And there's this stress and there's this expectation. And then on the other hand, if you're not married, then there's this expectation or there's this kind of forefront of, like they say, it's a singles awareness. But you begin to realize that everybody else, you see all the commercials about love. And you begin to see everybody else is oogly and on Facebook and on social media. Everybody's pasting pictures of their boo and their honey and all this stuff on there. And you kind of realize, like, I, I, I don't have that. And, and it brings to the forefront of our lives something that's very important, something that's very critical, something that every person, regardless of your walk in life, regardless of your age, regardless of how... how sentimental or how tough you are or how old or how young you are, every person experiences this subject. And the subject is finding love. Tonight I want to talk about finding love. Because you see, humanity, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter how old or how young, 
from the oldest or the hardest man to the youngest, uh, newest infant, every person on the face of the earth wants to be loved. You can't escape it. You can say, no, I don't care about that. I'm not stopped. But when you look deep down and you're honest with yourself, there's something on the inside of you that says, I want to, I need to be loved. To the point where we spend our lives searching and seeking for that love. Sometimes we find it in our relationships with our husbands or our wives. We've got children or grandchildren or family members or friends or aunts or uncles or whatever it might be that we have these meaningful relationships in life. But we spend our life trying to find this ultimate subject called love. You know, we look at the stories of of what society, not just society or Hollywood, but just over the the millennium, man has has kind of idolized this subject of love. You look at the stories of of Elizabeth Bennet to her her Mr. Darcy, and and you know, know, this this scene in in Pride and Prejudice where he kind of takes a big deep breath and, you've bewitched me body and soul, and I love, I love, I love, you know, the girls are like, oh! Or or the Romeo and the Juliet, the the ultimate of love. Everybody wants to be loved. It's something that every human being on the face of the earth can relate to. Because we all need love. And we spend our lives looking for this love. This love that will will bring us out of the chaos of our lives. This love that will will settle the unrest of uncertainty of, I don't know what to do here and I don't know what to do there, but if I can find that one person or if I can can just have that one friend or or if my, my children will just do this, that one love will help to settle the uncertainties of the future. Or that one love will bring fulfillment in my life and all of a sudden I'll realize that that there's a reason for me to be here. And we look and we look and we seek and we seek and we search and we search and we watch the movies and we read the books and we hear the stories and we look to the left and we look to the right and we compare and say, man, they have a great love over here. Or Ronald and Nancy Reagan that just had the the most romantic story or, or whatever it might be. We can all relate to the fact that we need love. And we can all relate to the fact, if you're honest with yourselves, that we look for it all of our lives. But I want to share with you something today. We're talking about the subject of finding love. In this season of stress, in this season of uncertainty, in this season of remembering what you might have had that you didn't have anymore, maybe you you lost a loved one and now you're reflecting back and remembering how you used to have a valentine, whatever it might be, in the season of stress, in the season of thinking about love, this subject and this topic, I wanted to ask you a question. Did you know when we look for this great, one, amazing, life-changing love, did you know that every person in this room already has it? That's right. Already has it. We already have the one love of our life that will change everything about us. You say, yeah, amen, Pastor Luke. I got my wife. I got my husband. Pastor Luke, when I look in the eyes of my child, when I look at my grandbaby, I can realize, I can relate that there is that, I, I would, there's nothing I would do. And I'm not talking about that love. That's a great love. But I'm talking about the greatest love that we will ever know. We already have it. You say, what are you talking about? We already have it. I don't feel loved. I feel pretty alone. I feel like I don't have any friends. I feel like I don't have any family. I feel like my my relationship at home with my husband or with my wife or with my children is crumbling. My family, we've been separated or estranged for years. and, And we're talking about this great love. And here you're trying to tell me that I've got this great love already in my life and I have it. Yes. I'll start by telling you. There's a verse that we all know. I'm pretty sure whether you've been in church or you've never been in church, you've heard this verse before. It's probably the most famous verse of all the New Testament or even in the Bible. I even heard one author say that if all of the word of God, was, every Bible was burnt or every word of God was destroyed, but all we had left was this verse, we would still have the gospel message. And that's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. You know what that means? That means you. 
Yeah. That means me. Yeah. You know what that means? That means the guys in downtown San Bernardino that are committing vandalism, that are tagging up the streets, that are doing armed robbery. That means the people across the world that are, that are committing terrorist acts in the name of another God. That means the people in China who have never heard. That means the people in the deepest, darkest jungles of the Andes Mountains and the Amazon River. Uh, God so loved them that He gave His only begotten Son. You see, there is a love on earth that cannot be matched, that cannot be surpassed, that cannot be topped, that cannot be mount, uh, surmounted. There is a love that you and I, if we can understand and grab and see and realize and utilize in our life, will begin to change the stress and the hardships that we have when we think about this subject of finding love. Because ultimately, it's there in front of us. We just have to realize it. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. I love how Romans, the fifth chapter, Romans in the fifth chapter, verse number eight, I'll just put it on the overhead for you. It says, in this, God demonstrated his love for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God showed us his love through the evidence, through the proof, through the action of giving his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross so that we could reunite with God. So that we wouldn't see this old man in the sky with a big white beard and glasses and a two by four waiting to bring down judgment because we've made mistakes. But rather we would begin to recognize the greatest love the world has ever seen from God who created the world and man in his own image to us mankind once separated by sin but now reunited to God through his son Jesus Christ. God demonstrated his love for you by giving Jesus to die on a cross Amen. while you were still a sinner. You weren't even a thought in your parents' eyes 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross. But yet, God saw you when he sent his son to the cross. Because he so loves you that he gave his son. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of 1 John. 1 John in the 4th chapter. 1 John in the 4th chapter. I'm going to read it to you tonight out of the, the, a different translation, a more modern translation. But always it's good to go back to the original or, or the, uh, the, the King James or the New King James. It's a literal translation. The translation that we're going to read out of tonight is called the New Living Translation, which is a contextual translation, which means they took the whole story and made it all kind of fit in today's modern English. Sometimes it gets it good. Sometimes it doesn't. It's always good to bounce off of a literal translation, which would be like the New King James or the original King James version. But in 1 John in the fourth chapter, I want to take you talking about this great love that we've seen. 1 John in the fourth chapter, we're going to look at a couple of verses and we'll kind of go through some of these verses tonight and discovering the subject of finding love. It says that God showed how much he loved us. The Bible says that God in the New King James manifested his love towards us. Manifested literally just means to make known. As if you can, you can think of it like this, stood on the top of a hill and shouted at the top of his lungs the love he has for you and I. It says that God so showed how he loved us by sending his one and his only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. Verse number 10. This is real love. This is real love. Listen, I, I don't doubt for a moment, I don't question for a moment the, the love that you have between your husband or your wife or the love that you have for your children or your grandchildren or your family, your mother or your father, or your grandfather or your grand, whatever it might be. I don't question, I don't doubt, and I don't play down for a moment the love that you're experiencing in your life right now. But the Bible says this is real love, true love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. God loves us. That is true love. That is real love. That is lasting love. You see, when you get into a relationship with your husband and your wife, you know what? The, the, the sad fact is the majority uh, of relationships, one of you will die before the other. 
Oh, you're like, man, Pastor Lee, you're really grim on the subject of love. The sad fact is you're going to have children and they're going to grow up and they're going to move out of your house and you're not going to know what to do with yourself anymore because you spent 25 years, 30 years, 40 years of your life training them to be an adult. The truth is, is that you're going to have a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or a family member or a friend that's going to, that's going to pass or that's going to leave or that's going to separate or become estranged because of distance or because of, of, of region or because of indifference or difference. But here the Bible says the love of God is not because we love God, but rather but because God loved us. Jesus Christ said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You see, the love of God is not determined on whether or not we're good or whether or not we're bad. The love of God is not determined whether or not we, we live or, or we're going to outlive God's love or we're going to underlive. The love of God does not separate because we make a mistake. The love of God does not separate because we choose to reject him. The the love of God is unconditional for humanity because we were made in his image and God loved you and I so much that he demonstrated his love for us. And that is real love. Why? Because it is a love that will never fail. Yeah. Amen. Never fail. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. You know, you might say, Pastor, look, it's great. It's wonderful. Man, it's awesome. Praise God. I get it. I hear it. You know, that statement, John 3, 16, I know it. I've heard it before. But that doesn't, that doesn't warm me up when I go to bed at night and I'm alone. Pastor, look, that verse, it doesn't, it doesn't fill my heart when I'm going through a tragedy in my life and I don't feel like there's anybody else in the world that cares about me. You might say, Pastor Luke, that's, that, I, I so appreciate that. And it's so good to come to church and just to hear that God loves me. But that doesn't make me feel any better in my life. And the truth is, I've been there myself. I've heard John 3.16 in times of, uh, of times of pain. I've heard John 3.16 in times where Stacy, everybody thinks because I used an example once of Stacy and I in a fight. They're like, you guys fight too much. That was like a one-time event. But I, I, I've felt that way before when Stacy and I maybe weren't there or before that or, or when the kids are, are, you know, sick or whatever. I mean, God, where are you? It doesn't make a difference in my life. I hear the verses, I hear, I hear the pastor preaching and I clap when he says that I'm loved, but it doesn't change anything. See, the truth is, is I've been there before myself. But here's the reality. The reality is, is it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a change. It doesn't bring about that warmth and that fulfillment that we so desire when we seek after love because we're looking for love in all the wrong places. We're looking for love in all the wrong places. We're looking for love in the arms of the man. We're looking for love in, arms, in the arms of the woman. We're looking for love in the arms of our children, of our grandchildren. We're looking for love in the, in the support of our friendships. We're looking for love in, in, in the support of our family. We're looking for love, this fulfillment, this, this, this unifying uh, desire to, to, to fulfill us and to, to, to set our minds at ease at the, at the hands of another person. But reality is, is that we're looking for love in all of the wrong places. Because our love for God has got to be the greatest and the most, uh, most love. Uh, that's bad English. The, our love for God has got to be the greatest love we experience in our lives. As a matter of fact, I've got a little statement up there. I'll pop it up there. It says that we've got to learn to make God's love first over all other loves in our lives. First above your wife. What? First above your children. Above your family. Above your friends. Above your connection or your name. And even above oh, yourself. God, the love that we have for God and the love that we experience from God must be the summit of the mountain of love. That there is no higher place. There is no higher place 
that we can experience as humanity in our lives, but the love of God. The love of God has got to be above all others. Verse number 16 of 1 John, the fourth chapter, says this. It says that we know how much God loves us. And we have put our trust in his love. You say, it doesn't make a difference because I'm looking in the wrong spot. You've got to learn to put your trust in God's love by making God's love the greatest love you'll ever see. The greatest love you'll ever experience. The greatest love that you'll ever have in your life. And he says that we have got to learn to trust, put our trust in love. Why? Because, oh, this is huge. Because God is love. Oh my gosh, it just got even deeper than before. Because God demonstrated his love by giving Jesus. But now we see in the Bible that God is love love. The reflection of love, the reflection of relationships, the reflection of the connection that you have with another human being here on earth is a reflection given to you, a gift given to you and I by God, the creator, the designer of love itself. Our love has got to be the greatest. Our love for God has got to be the greatest in our lives. The most secure love we have is in God. Our first and our foremost love has got to be in God through Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, the book of Revelation in the second chapter, Jesus, as he's talking to the churches, he tells one of his churches, he says, I have this against you, that you have left your love. Doesn't say that. Your first love. My objection to you is that you have left Your first love. You have relied on your own ability to fulfill the need for love in your life when really it's my job, God says. Luke in the 14th chapter, I don't have it on there. I probably should have put it on there. You can write a note. Luke in the 14th chapter, verse number 26. As Jesus has a great crowd gathered to him and everybody's coming around to listen to his words, Luke chapter 14, verse number 26. In the New Living Translation, Jesus says, That unless your love for me, uh, or your love for me, your love for others should look like hate in comparison to your love for me. I got it. I can get it. Jesus is saying, he's not saying that you should hate everybody else and love Jesus. You could read it for yourself. Please do. Don't take my word for it. But he's saying that by comparison, your love for God and God's love for you, the relationship that you have for God, when you put everything else on the other side of the scale, when you compare the two, when you've got the love of God on one side and human love, whether it's your wife, your spouse, your friends, your family, all of them combined, when you put them on the scale, it should tip so heavily to the side of God that it doesn't even appear to be love to the other ones. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to learn to love me above all else. But we've been looking for love in all the wrong places. You know, relationships fail because we try to fill a void in our lives with something that cannot fill that void. You've got a void on the inside of you, an emptiness, something missing, and we try to fill that void with something that cannot fill it. We try to fill that void with our husbands and our wives and that's great and the love is wonderful and you can go your entire life and have have the notebook kind of love and have a perfect relationship but still not reach the pinnacle that God has for you. You can add your children into that mix and you can have 20 of them and throw them in there and still not reach the top of what God has for you because we try to fill a void that's on the inside of us with something that cannot fill it and therefore relationships fail because we go from one to the next to the next to the next. Jesus, if you remember in the book of John at the, at the, at the well, he was sitting at the well and a Samaritan woman comes and he says, I'd like a drink of water. And she says, man, Jews don't drink from the same cup as, as, as Samaritans. You got a cup because I don't see one on you. And so he starts talking. He says, man, you don't even understand. If you you knew who you were talking about, 
you wouldn't ask me about my cup. You would ask me if you could have a drink from the water I want to give you. Because the water I would give you would be a spring on the inside of you that would overflow, that would never run dry, that would, that would, that would never disappoint. You would never thirst again. And she says, sir, I need this water. And he says, tell me about yourself. And, and, and she begins to talk and he says, listen, you've had five husbands. And the guy you're with right now is not even your husband. You are trying to fill a hole in your life that with something that cannot fill the hole. He spoke to her right where she was at, at the subject of love. She found her fulfillment in the arms of a man. And when that fulfillment ran dry, she went to another one, to another one, to another one, to another one, to another one. How many people in this world, including you and me, live a life just like that? Where we search for this love. We desire this, this filling in our lives, this emptiness, this void that's on the inside of us. But we've got to learn to fill it with what God has for us. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans that the love of God is shed abroad or poured out upon our hope. Hope doesn't disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. I'm a real visual person. I, I like, when I read a book, I like the books with pictures. You know what I mean? Anybody, you're like, amen. Maybe because I grew up in a TV generation, right? So I just, I like the movies. I, well, I read the book. When you can watch the movie, right? All right. So I have a little visual illustration just to kind of exemplify what we're talking about right here. So I'll move this to right here. I don't want to get my Bible all wet. So I just want to give you a little representation of, of, who we, of what's going on, what I'm talking about here. This, I got some jugs. These are the jugs, if you remember, if you were here on a Sunday morning. These are the jugs that uh, I, I had hands and fingers in. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. This represents you and I, a vessel. The Bible talks about us being like jars of clay. Well, I couldn't find a jar of clay, and if it was a jar of clay, you couldn't see through it. So this represents you and I, a vessel created from the very moment we were born, we had an emptiness on the inside of us that we needed to be loved. If you've ever seen an infant in the arms of its mother, there is a desire from the very first moment of life for love. When I held my little baby girl, she would cry, 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 cry. But when mama held her, there was just something about mama. She just needed the mama's love. We have an emptiness on the inside of us. There's a cavity, a desire, a longing to be filled with love. So we're born with this hole. We're born with this void. And so then all of a sudden something happens. You see that man. You see that woman. You met them in high school or in college or, or, or later on. You met them in the singles ministry on Valentine's Day when you were having a party. Amen. Hallelujah. And they changed your life. All of a sudden you say, I am fulfilled. <laughs> but we try to fill this cavity, this emptiness with something. This here represents our love, the love of your spouse, the love between you and your children, the love between you and your family or you and your friends. And we try to fill this emptiness on the inside of us with something that will never completely fill us. There's still room. There's still more. Well, what do we do? Well, okay. Well, you know, my husband, my, 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 our, our relationship's been a, bit, a little bit rocky. So, you know what? We'll, we'll have a kid. All right. And there we go. Since it's a baby, it's a little bit. And then, well, we'll have a little bit more. And then, we're, then, we'll, then there'll be a teenager and we'll give it back. No, I'm just kidding. And it still leaves an emptiness. It's still... Not full. Jesus told the woman at the well, it'll run over. You'll never run dry. You'll never thirst again. So we try to fill this emptiness, this cavity on the inside of us, this longing for fulfillment. We try to fill it with that which will never fulfill our love. But then God comes along and he says, I've got love that is a God-sized hole for your life. And... When we begin to live in the love of God, all of a sudden, our life becomes fulfilled. Now, now, wait a minute. Jesus said overflowing. Oh, come on. 
and our life is full. But you know what? It gets better. Because now, when you begin to add love, your marriage, your kids, your friends, your family, your love pours over. It just gets better. It just gets deeper. It just grows and it goes stronger and your relationship just gets better and better and you're, you're, you say, man, my marriage is on the rocks, Pastor. Like, you don't understand what's going on. My, my wife, she doesn't love me anymore. My husband doesn't love me. My kids have run out and they're not doing the things of God. When we fill ourselves the cavity that's on the inside of us with God's love and then we begin to add the love that could no longer fill us now we're overflowing now the love between a husband and a wife gets better now the love between a parent and a son or a daughter grows now the love between grandparents and grandchildren or friends and family it begins to overflow because Jesus said I love you so much it'll never run dry but we've got to learn how to live in God's love because you know what there's a difference between knowing a love story and living a love story. And you say, man, that's great. That's wonderful. But when I walk out of this place on Valentine's Day when I'm stressing out on what to get my wife or when I'm thinking about how I don't have a wife or whatever it might be, when you leave this place and you feel like you need to be loved, there's a difference between knowing that you are loved and living a life of love. And that's what I want to leave today is how do we find God's love? How do we find God's love? The beautiful thing about finding God's love is it's not like following a treasure map where we got to follow X marks the spot. But when we live in God's love, our life begins to change. And finding God's love begins to change all of the love around us. I remember when I was in youth ministry, Pastor Eddie Algara, who preaches at our Coachella, uh, uh, the Rock Church of Coachella, showed me this. When you have a relationship, a baseline, here it is. That's you. Maybe you have a wife or a husband. You're here and you're here. And you say, man, as time progresses, we grow further apart. I don't know how I can love my husband anymore. He's, he's been a real jerk lately. Like Pastor Joe said, give, throw, you know, douse your spouse. But anyway. <laughs> as we fill ourselves with God, we climb. And as we climb, we grow. And as your husband or your wife or your friends or your children fill themselves with God, you grow closer together and closer together and closer together. And the more you are with God, it looks like the food pyramid, the more you are with God, the closer point A to point B is to each other. Your love for God will improve your love and your relationship and all other love in your life. So Jesus didn't say you shouldn't love. No. Jesus says we must love. But he says you got to love God first. You've got to love God most. It's got to be the biggest and the greatest love in your life because as you do, you will be filled. And as you do, you will grow and grow and grow. And those who you love, you will come closer to. Your relationship will be more fulfilled. Your marriage will stop falling apart and it will start falling back together because God's hand is on it. Because you love God, God loves you, and you love each other. That is a love triangle that the soap operas can't touch. So how do we get this love? How do we live a, a love story versus knowing a love story? It's so easy. It's so easy. I just give you three, three key words on this, how to live a love story. And the first one is to live a love story, to find God's love. You got to accept it. It's already there. It's not a treasure map. It, it's not like I got to go from point A to point B. I got to do this. Pastor Luke, I, I, I got to get myself good to go to church. You know I mean? If I walk in that building, I remember I felt that way. I walk in the building, it was going to, it was going to burn down. God don't love me. You don't understand what I've done. The Bible says, John 3, 16, God so loved the world. That means you. That means the terrorists. Listen, guys, that means ISIL in Iraq. For God so loved the world, which means nothing you could do. The Bible says in Romans, the 8th chapter, there is nothing that could separate us from the love of God. But it starts, how do you find love? It starts by accepting it. Why? Because you could have love. You could have a desire you could say, man, I need love in my life. But if you're closed, if your heart's blocked off, if, if you're saying, I, I, it's just not for me, 
I don't believe it. It doesn't matter what love comes your way. It's not getting in. The love of God is already there. Shed abroad, laid out for us on that cross 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ said it is finished. The love of God was completed for you and I. All we have got to do is accept and open our hearts to God and to begin to realize that God loves us in our lives. Bible tells us in Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice, uh-oh, and opens the door. We get this idea that the love of God is so strong that Jesus is at the door. And, and Revelation 3.20 doesn't say, Behold, I stand at the door knock. It says, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I'm going to kick it in. But you see, you've got to open the door and accept God's love. You say, Pastor Luke, I'm not worthy. You're not. Neither am I. Nobody on this earth was worthy. The Bible tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But yet, Romans 5, 8 confirms what we had already read, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. It's not about being worthy to accept God's love. God's love doesn't say, I love you. Will you love me in return? God's love just says, I love you. And you got to learn to accept it in your life. Amen. Take it in. How do we find this love? How do we get this love? We got to accept it. Secondly, we got to rehearse it. You got to rehearse God's. We can all in this room, I'm sure every person, even if you're a tough guy in this room, tattoos all over your head and your face, I bet you could tell a love story. Some of them. You might know about Romeo and Juliet. You might know about Elizabeth Bennett and Mr. Darcy. You might know about Beauty and the Beast. I don't know. You know a love story. Why? Because you've rehearsed it. You fed yourself, you watched the movie, you read the book or you heard the story or somebody told you and you thought to yourself, man, that's a cool story. That's a cool story how that, how that belle, she loved that hairy beast. Even, she saw on the inside because love sees beyond the outside. <laughs> and you fed yourself love. You rehearsed it in your life. You're no stranger to rehearsing love. But now start rehearsing God's love in your life. The psalmist says in Psalm 63, verse number three, he says, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Verse number four, he goes on and he says, I will bless you while I live. I'll lift up my hands in your name. In verse number five, he says, my soul will be satisfied, filled as with marrow and fatness and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. In verse number six, he says, when I remember you on my bed, Remember he said, that doesn't make me feel any better when I'm at bed at night. There it is. When I rehearse your love for me when I'm alone, I meditate on you in the night watches when I'm all by myself and there's nobody around me. I will rehearse God's love for me. Start speaking over you what God says. John 3, 16, for God so loved me that he gave Jesus Christ. John chapter 15, that there is no greater love than a man that lays down his life for his friends and I will do that for you. John chapter 17, Jesus says, God, I pray that they would see that you have loved me and you love them as you have loved me. First John, the fourth chapter, talking about God is love. We see love and love and love all throughout the Bible. You just got to rehearse it. Get it on the inside of you by accepting it. Rehearse yourself by building it up. And now how do you find God's love? You start acting in God's love. it has been times in my life, man, I've been down. I've been out. I just didn't feel like there was anybody around, anybody that cared, even my family. They just because just they didn't know. It's not that they abandoned, just didn't know. We beat ourselves up. And all of a sudden, God will share his love with me by one of his faithful servants. We are the vessels that carry out the will of God here on earth. And in my times of sorrow, in my times of depression, in my times of getting down and dumped, man, I preached a lousy message. Nobody said it was good. Uh, and somebody, God's faithful message, thank you, Lord, will send me a text message or an email. Pastor, look, I just want you to know I was thinking about you. I was praying for you. Hey, man, you know, brother or sister or a family member or a friend or somebody from across the country, hey, I just was thinking about you. I just want you to know I was praying for you. Boom! All of a sudden, that's somebody acting in God's love. And I have just felt it. I have just seen it. I have just lived it in my life. Yeah. When we act in God's love, what we do is we get out of the Eeyore mentality. Oh, 
girl, nobody loves me. And you put your chin up a little bit. Stick your chest out a little bit. Guys, girls, you all right? <laughs> say what you say about God. Man, God loves me. And I'm going to walk like God loves me. I'm going to have a little pep in my step. I don't have to go to the, the little daisy. He loves me. He loves me. Not he loves because I know he loves me. And I begin to act in God's love and love somebody else. My wife was telling me a story. She says, she says, babe, she came home from, she was at one of those big box stores a couple of weeks ago that sells everything. She says, man, babe, I got suckered. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You got suckered. And she always buys everything at the store. But she was like, man, there was a guy outside and he was asking for food. And I, and I just told him, I was like, dude, I don't have any money. And she's like, I got, I got to my car and I felt bad. And she's like, because I knew I had money. It's just like, I went back and I told him, I was like, there's a restaurant on the inside of, that, in the, inside of the store. And she says, come on, man, I'll buy you lunch. She says, the guy says, came back to me, says, man, that's great. I don't, I don't really want the lunch from the restaurant. I would just be happy if you just buy me a, a bag of Top Ramen. You know, she took him. I don't know, did you take him or did you just leave him? You left him. Yeah, she, Thank you, good job. She said, hold on, I'll be right back. And she said she bought him a big old box of Top Ramen and vegetables and everything else and she came outside of the store with that big you know the 300 pack of top ramen that cost like 45 cents she came outside of that store with a big old thing of top ramen and said here you go she was acting in the love of God that man was down and out but all of a sudden God showed his love for that person because of his faithful servant you and I have got to love each other. The Bible tells us in 1 John, the fourth chapter, verse number 19, says that we love because God first loved us. If you've got your new King James Bible, it says we love God. If you've got a new, loving, new living translation, it says we love others. Or here on the overhead, on the new international version, it says we love. Which one is it? All of the above. We experience love because God loved us. And in 1 John chapter 4, verse number 11, I believe. Did I have that on there? Did I put that on there? Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. To walk and act in God's love for our lives. How do you find love? You accept. A C C E P T. Right? How do you find love? You rehearse. Now, this one's weird. R E hear C. Right? And act. How do you find God's love? This is the process of internalization. Turn all. All right. This is the process of upward growth. This is the process of outward expression. Get it in you. Build it up by rehearsing. Let it out. You'll live a love that you've never lived before. You'll never feel alone. You'll never feel abandoned. You'll never have to worry about the stress of competing. Is this the greatest love or could it be any better? Because your love is already full. Every little bit that you add just overflows from there. Because you and I can find love through God. Did you guys get something out of that tonight? See, I wanted to do offering and announcements before him because I can't just tell you that God loves you and think that it's okay for you to leave and say, well, God loves me. Good. Praise God. I've got to tell you the truth. God loves you so much. I'm going to ask you, just give me a second more of your time. I'll let you out in just a minute. God loves you so much that he gave Jesus Christ for you and I. He paid the ultimate price. And I love my little boy. Some of y'all saw him. Everybody was like, is that your son? Finally, we see him yesterday. I love my little boy so much, he'll never even know how much I love him. I understand now why my mom calls me Lukey, because he'll always be my baby. But there's times when even if I love him, I don't approve of what he's doing. 
And you can always have the love of God and there's nothing that will take you from the love of God. But God's approval for you has a different thing because He gave for you Jesus. And in return, He wants a wholehearted love. The greatest, the biggest, the most love in your life. A wholehearted relationship with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. And it would be a shame for us to walk out of this place and just think, God loves me. That's great. That's wonderful. I can do anything I want because God loves me. And not understand that God loved you and I so much He paid a price for us. And in return for the price of His Son, Jesus Christ, He wants our love in return. So today I want to give you the opportunity to examine your heart, to examine your life. You can't get to heaven because of your thoughts or your actions or your wishes. You can't get this experience, this fulfillment in your life because your parents told you that you're a Christian, so that must mean you've got it. You can't get this because you come to church and you volunteer. You can't get this fulfillment in your life because you've got a label or a cross around your neck. You don't get this fulfillment because you give to the Red Cross. This only comes through God's Son, Jesus Christ, who paid the price, the demonstration of God's love. And in return, God wants all of your heart. He wants all of your life. We saw a, a chapter in the book of Revelation. Jesus tells the church in the book of Revelation, listen, I come back, and when I come back, I'd rather find you hot, or I'd rather find you cold, I'd rather find you all the way in love or all the way out, because if you're a little bit half full and your lid is closed... I'm going to vomit you from my mouth, Jesus says. And what he's saying is that lukewarm Christians aren't real Christians at all. That they'll be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be lukewarm? Lukewarm simply means in your relationship that you've got your ups and your downs and your ins and your outs. You're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. You've got this schizophrenic Christianity that, you know, God's going to hit me on the head with a two by four one day and he loves me the next day and I messed up and he hates me and he loves me. You don't have the, the understanding of God's relationship and His intent for you. And that's because you don't have a wholehearted relationship with Jesus Christ. Today, I want to give you the opportunity. Jesus, in John the third chapter, as He's talking to a man by the name of Nicodemus, He says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Born again. What does that mean? He says, Nicodemus, what is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of spirit is spirit. It's to be born again is to have a renewal to be filled, to go from being this empty vessel bound by sin and death to becoming this completely new creation by the love of God and the salvation and the gift of God through eternal salvation through Jesus Christ to be full. You are completely different. No longer are you defined by who you are. And Jesus says to be born again. It's not what you think. It's not what Hollywood says. It's a wholehearted, all or nothing commitment, relationship with God through Jesus. And today, if that's you in this place and you say, man, you know what? i kind of been playing the game. i kind of been feeling like in and out. I just never really realized or accepted. I've heard it all my life. My parents took me to church when I was a kid. My, 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 my grandma used to jam the scriptures down my throat. I know what you're talking about, John 3, but you've never opened up and accepted. The Bible says that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. It's your choice. It's a gift. God has given you the option, the free will choice to open up and to accept and to allow Jesus to be the Lord and Savior and the leader of your life or to say, you know what, that's not for me and reject His gift. It's your call. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force His way or kick His way in like we talked about. You've got to make the choice. And today I want to give you that opportunity. Jesus says that if you confess Him before men, He will confess you before His Father. But He says if you deny Him, He will deny you for us, Father. Today, I want to give you the opportunity. Let's not do it your way or some well-meaning church committee or author's way, but today, let's do it God's way through Jesus Christ by accepting Him, by making that decision to start the relationship, to allow God's love to fill you and to reciprocate it in a relationship growing every day with Jesus Christ. Jesus came and said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but He says, I have come to give you life and more abundantly. It's not even just about what happens when you die. That's great and that's wonderful. But your relationship, your love, this growing relationship with Jesus Christ starts today here on earth right now for the rest of your life. And it starts by making the conscientious decision to accept Jesus into your heart, into your life. So in a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to do it like this. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'll go three. I'll smack my hands together. And if that's you, in just a moment, we'll all do it together. I want you to do something. I want you to pop your hand up. 
What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give God my heart. I want to give God my life. That love you talked about today, that's, 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 what I, that's what I'm, where I'm at. I need that. You see, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge your hand. You can put it right back down. You can sit there and do nothing or you can make the decision. It's your choice. Who should raise their hands if you've never given God your heart, you've never given God your life? In just a moment, if that's you, get ready. Who should raise your hands? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, you've been, if you've been running from God instead of to God, listen, don't walk out of this place without making sure. Open up today and accept the gift of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're not sure. Maybe you did this as a, as a child in the youth group or in the, in the Harvest Crusade. You prayed that prayer, but you never really followed through with your life and with your action. Today, if that's you in this place today, don't walk out without making sure. Today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day your life begins to change. And it starts by making the decision to follow Jesus. You say, man, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. I won't embarrass you. But even if you were, it would be a whole lot better to spend a moment of embarrassment than to go without for the rest of your life. It starts by making that choice. You've had doctors and dentists and DMV appointments. Today is a divine appointment between you and God. It doesn't matter if you're in the front row, the back row. It doesn't matter if you're on the side. I don't care if you've been in this church for 26 years or one hour. What matters is the condition of your heart and the condition of your soul. And today is the opportunity for you to get right with God, to ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind, and to accept that love that we talked about today and to grow in it every day with your relationship with Jesus Christ and see fulfillment in your life. It starts by making that decision. So all across this auditorium, wherever you're at, from the front row to the back row, if you're outside listening to the, to the sound of my voice in the family rooms, I can see you guys through the windows. If you're at home watching online, this is your opportunity as well. In just a moment, you'll see, a, uh, when you minimize your screen, you can see a little button that you can follow through, but it starts by making that decision. And I'm going to count. And if that's you in this place, be proud, be ready for it. And I want to see your hand. I'll count to three. And if that's you, pop it up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Put it right back down. Here we go. You ready? One, two, Three. Let me see your hands in this place. One, two, three, four, five. I see you. Six back there. Anybody else in this place today? Seven. I got you back there. Eight. Like nine. I got you. If I saw you, you could put your hands on so I don't count you again. Nine or nine wise people or so. Anybody else? You say, man, I wonder if I should. Ten. I got you. you say, yeah, I wonder if I should. You should. This is your moment. This is your time. Don't waste another moment. Don't waste another moment overlooking true love because you're looking for love. Start by accepting it today. Anybody else in this place today? I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else today? Well, praise God for the 10 or so wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what we're going to do. All 10 of you that raised your hand, or those of you that should have raised your hand, but you didn't, you know who you are. You know, man, you're thinking, I missed it. Listen, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You say, I want to. I, I want to start this. That's making the decision. Now it's time to follow through and act on that decision by accepting Jesus into your heart, into your life. And we're going to do that together. We're going to change destinies together, you and me. So in just a moment, we're all going to stand. I want to ask if you raise your hand or you just should have raised your hand, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get out of your seat, get into the, get into the aisle and come meet me right here at this altar. We're going to change destinies together right here, right now. So let's all stand together. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on, come meet me right here, right now. Please don't leave at this time. But if that's you, come on, out of your seat, out of your chair. Let's change destinies together right now. You can come. Wherever you're at. Never runs out on me. You come. Love never fails and never gives up. Never runs you come. out on me. You. Your love never fails and never gives up. Come on, if that's never you. Never runs out on me. Lord, your love never fails, never gives up. You, never runs out on me. You could come. It's, still, it's not too late. Wherever you're at. They're still never coming. We'll wait for you. Your love never fails. It never gives up. Never runs out on me. Lord, your love never fails. Never gives up. Never runs out Praise on God. me. Well, hey, guys. You came. Today is a new day. It's the first day of the rest of your life. You're not going to a funeral celebration or a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Are you going to get born again? Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really cool guy. Nothing weird goes on, okay? 
You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. What does that mean, Lord and Savior? We don't talk like that very much anymore. By asking him to be the leader of your life today, inviting him into your life, accepting that love. Secondly, he's going to give you some information, some real easy literature, real easy reading, a couple pages, super easy, I promise, to help point you in the right direction. You walk out of this place and say, where do I go from here? We're going to point you in that right direction. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back, hang out with us. We want to get you connected with a friend here at church, somebody that will sit with you, teach you some things about the Word of God, get you strong in the ways of God so you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in everything that God has for you. So if you would just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin. And I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.